The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. And thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to do a little housekeeping about the webinar while people are still joining us and logging on. Um, everyone is muted right now except for the panelists. Um, and we'll get to introductions in just a moment. We are going to be taking questions at the end of the presentation, but you can submit your question at any point by typing it into the chat window on your screen. And if you don't see the chat window or the question box, just click the little orange arrow at the top of your screen and the chat box will appear. Um, we are also recording this webinar, so you will be able to access the information afterwards and pass it on to others, or if for some reason somebody missed the webinar, they will be able to uh, look at the slides and listen to the webinar at a later time. Um, and I'll send you all a link to that when it is up on our website, but it should probably be tomorrow um, sometime. So again, everybody's on mute. Go ahead and type in your questions as they occur to you during the webinar, um, but we'll be taking those at the end. And I'm going to go ahead and turn over the webinar to um, Chris McCahill, who's in our office here at SSTI, and he's going to go ahead and introduce uh, the panelists and the topic. And um, Chris, you should be able to take it away from here. Great, thanks Robbie. And thanks uh, to everyone else um, for joining us today. Um, I'll just start off by um, introducing SSTI to any folks who might not be super familiar with us. Uh, we're a network of reform-oriented state DOTs uh, founded in 2010 and housed at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, we work Muted. in three ways. Uh, the first is through an executive level community of practice. This is where we actually gather together uh, mostly CEOs of state DOTs uh, about once a year to come together um, and share ideas and uh, discuss what's challenging them. We also offer technical assistance to mostly state DOTs again. Um, and this technical assistance is uh, one example of, of where a lot of our work around accessibility measures um, comes from. Uh, and finally, we act as a resource uh, for the larger transportation community uh, through things like uh, today's webinar. Um, and we have an extensive um, list of resources on the website. Um, our other presenter today, Matt Pettit, is from City Labs. City Labs is a global, pro global provider of mobility analytics for businesses and government agencies. Uh, they have a 40-year history serving more than 2,500 clients across 70 countries worldwide. You might be familiar with some of their products, um, Cube uh, and a newer product, Streetlytics. Um, we've been working with City Labs uh, a few years ago when we were first becoming interested in how to operationalize accessibility measures uh, within transportation agencies. Um, we didn't at the time have a way to actually uh, measure accessibility. Um, and it was around that time that City Labs product Sugar Access came around. Um, so we started using that and, um, and ever since then have been sort of working side by side with City Labs to advance best practices around the use of accessibility measures. Uh, so um, without wasting any time, we'll jump right into the, to today's topic, um, accessibility measures. Um, so I'll just start with an intro to accessibility. Um, so first off, why measure accessibility? Um, one of the major reasons is that when we're looking at ways of measuring transportation system performance, we typically look um, at a single point in the transportation system, a single link in the network, and we use mobility measures. Uh, so this could be travel speed, what's the speed on the link, what's the level of service on the road, uh, what's the vehicle throughput or even the person throughput. The problem is that that only looks at one little piece uh, of the transportation picture, um, and it doesn't tell us a whole lot necessarily about um, people's ability to get from point A to point B. Um, it has a whole bunch of other neg negative consequences like for example, the only way to therefore improve the transportation system performance 
is to uh, in, in improve the travel speed on a certain link. Again, doesn't really tell us uh, how much about uh, how, how people can get from point A to point B. So that's why we moved to accessibility measures. Um, to do this, we need uh, a little bit more information. So we need to know origins of where people um, are starting their trips or where they might want to travel from, uh, maybe their homes. We need to know destinations. Um, so where are maybe jobs or other destinations that people need to get to? And then what we're really interested in is the ability to travel between them. So obviously mobility um, is a piece of that, of that puzzle, right? The speed on the roads that they need to use affect their ability to get from point A to point B. Um, in some cases, that's a big part of, of their ability to reach a destination, um, but not always, right? Um, if people uh, live um, much closer to their destinations, uh, for example, in more compact type places like cities, um, the speeds on the roads are, are less important um, in, in influencing their way, their ability to get from point A to point B. Um, we also might be interested in multi-modes, um, in which case someone's ability to walk across a road is just as important as someone's ability to drive down it. So when we talk about accessibility, we usually define it something along these terms. It's the ease in travel time by which travelers can reach destinations by various modes. Like I said, uh, can they get from point A to point B? Um, there's a handful of questions we need to answer um, to sort of measure accessibility. Um, and with each of these questions comes a specific data need. Uh, the types of questions we need to, to ask are, where do people need to travel to? Uh, what modes are available? Uh, how far am I willing to travel? To get there? What time of day am I traveling? What else affects my travel experience? Uh, and for example, um, if someone is uh, walking along a, a really narrow sidewalk um, beside a four-lane highway, um, that might not actually affect their travel time, but it certainly affects um, their accessibility and their willingness to travel along that, that link of the network. So I'm going to just explain uh, the first three of these in a little more depth and then um, Matt Pettit from City Labs will cover the last two um, a little later. First off, where do I need to travel to? So when we talk about destinations and measuring accessibility, we usually think of them in, as two different types. Uh, the first one is work. Um, so this would be access to jobs or a subset of jobs. So access to jobs or maybe access to uh, jobs of a certain industry type or access to entry level jobs. Uh, this is the most common accessibility measure and the one you might have seen somewhere before. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't make up a, a whole, a very large percent of overall travel. It's only 20% of trips and 30% of vehicle miles traveled, or VMT. Uh, the reason we look at it is because, you know, it's often the most important trip that people think of um, from a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it's pretty easy to measure. And um, it also is closely related to uh, peak period traffic congestion, which is something we're usually really concerned about. So we do tend to focus on jobs. Uh, when reporting access to jobs, the unit that we're reporting is, is, is jobs. How many jobs can we reach, for example? Everything else um, falls into another bin, and this is non-work destinations. So this is access to everything else, like grocery stores, parks, banks, restaurants, and so on. Uh, all these trips combined make up a much larger portion of, of overall travel, 80% of trips and 70% of VMT. Um, it's a little more complex uh, concept, um, which is why we don't necessarily deal with it quite as often. Um, and it's also why we normally report non-work access um, as a score from zero to 100, with 100 being the best access and zero being the worst. Next question is what modes are available? So if we're measuring um, accessibility by automobile, uh, we need to know where the road networks are and what the travel speeds are on those roads. Uh, and this is more than just the speed limit, right? Because if we're really interested in how traffic congestion or, or daily, daily um, variations in speed affect accessibility, we need to know the actual travel speeds on those roads throughout the, throughout the day. For transit, we need to know where the transit routes are, where the stations are, what the headways are, how often do the trains come. And for walking and biking, we need to have a bunch of information about the, where the facilities are and what their conditions are. Uh, like I mentioned before, we need to know if someone uh, has access to just a tiny little sidewalk um, beside a four lane highway or you know, a nice wide sidewalk on an urban street. Um, similarly, we need to know if there's bike lanes um, or if people are just riding on a narrow shoulder with lots of fast moving traffic. Uh, these all affect walking and biking accessibility. 
The third question is how far am I willing to travel? Uh, often accessibility measures are reported using cumulative measures. And this is the, the number of opportunities that you can reach within a given travel time. So for example, jobs within 30 minutes. Uh, this is a really easy number to report. It's easy to understand, but it has some shortcomings, right? So for example, a job that's uh, five minutes away, in this case would count equally to a job that's 30 minutes away, but one that's 31 minutes away wouldn't count. Um, and there are some logistical um, cases where this could become an issue. Uh, here in Madison, where we're based, for example, there's a large employer of about 10,000 people that's about exactly 30 minutes away from the downtown. So depending on how you define um, that threshold, and precisely where that those jobs are located, uh, those jobs, 10,000 jobs may or may not count in your measure. So that's a problem. What we do to account for this is uh, report decay weighted measures. Um, so the basic idea is that things that are closer count more and things that are further away don't count for as much. This is what we use in our access score calculations. Uh, and the figure to the right as a way of illustrating this concept. Um, these are decay functions specifically for Wisconsin that we would use in our calculations. Uh, these are derived from actual travel surveys. So they're based on how far people actually travel to get to destinations. And you can see the gray line in the middle shows people's um, journey to work patterns um, by automobile. Uh, so a job that's um, uh, five minutes away, most people travel at least five minutes. So jobs that are within five minutes would count about 100%. But then the value of jobs drops off the further away they are. Um, so look at 30 minutes, for example. Um, a job, uh, only about 20% of people in, Mad in Wisconsin are willing to travel 30 minutes or more. Uh, so a job that, that's far, that is that far away would only count for about 20%. Um, if we increase or reduce our travel time to 20 minutes, um, then the utility of that job about doubles. So that job would count as uh, around 40%. Um, so all the jobs we multiply by, by their utility based on these functions. Uh, another thing you'll notice here is that uh, the light blue line, which is transit, um, shows that people travel uh, a bit further by transit. They're willing to travel a longer time by transit than they are by auto. Uh, and the dark blue line is walking, so people don't walk nearly as far to get to work. Um, the dotted lines show non-work trips. Um, just a quick thing to point out here is that people uh, driving and taking transit typically don't travel as far um, for non-work trips than they do for work trips. Uh, walking is the opposite. So people are willing to walk a little bit further for non-work things than they do for work. Once we have an accessibility measure, um, one of the things that we uh, work with a lot here at SSTI is uh, how to apply access scores and decision-making. So we sort of think about a handful of things, six things in this case, um, that you could use measures for. So you can scan existing conditions, right? If you uh, measure accessibility across your entire city or region, um, you can see where accessibility is good, where it's bad, where are the gaps. And then you can diagnose problems. So if you see a gap in accessibility, you can sort of zoom in and see what's affecting accessibility to, to um, be rated poorly in that place. You can assess solutions. So if you wanted to fill that gap, maybe by improving transit, uh, improving the speed on a road, some other project, uh, you can actually model that in, in an accessibility tool and see how it changes accessibility. You can engage stakeholders. Uh, the measure is pretty intuitive, um, and you'll see from a lot of the maps we're showing, it's a pretty easy concept to understand. People can relate to it. So you can communicate uh, transportation system performance to, to stakeholders. You can also communicate you know, among departments. Um, so engineers can talk to planners uh, using pretty much the same language. You can also predict outcomes. So we're not just interested in accessibility itself, um, but other outcomes of improving accessibility. Um, and I'll touch on that a little bit uh, later. Um, so the rest of what I'm going to cover is actually just jump right into some accessibility measures, uh, show what they look like, show how they can be used, um, so that if this is your first time really thinking about using accessibility measures, you kind of have a full grasp on that concept. Um, and then after I do that, we'll um, hand things over to Matt Pettit from City Labs, um, and he'll actually uh, show you inside the tool, Sugar Access, that we've used, um, so you get a better understanding of what, what it's like to, to run some of these analyses um, and what the tool can do. So all of our examples, or most of our examples, are going to be from Madison, Wisconsin, where we're based, where we first started using the software. This shows access to work by automobile uh, in the Madison area. Um, you can see that auto accessibility, this is access to jobs, 
um, is pretty high uh, in the core of a city where most of the jobs are. Uh, and then it drops off the farther out you get. It's pretty reasonable. You can also see auto accessibility is pretty high um, south of the downtown. Um, that's because there are pretty good highway connections there. If you wanna zoom in on a particular location and say, what does someone that's living in that point experience? Well, they can reach about 29,000 jobs within 15 minutes. Um, and then within 30 minutes, they can reach about 293,000 jobs. Um, and that's close to all of the jobs um, in, in the county. So um, you can see how that, that threshold might be a little deceiving if, if you want to use that 30 minute cutoff. Uh, within 45 minutes, someone can reach all the jobs. And again, remember this is, this is using the actual travel speeds on the roads during the AM period. What we report is the access score, which again, takes those jobs and it multiplies them times that decay function. Um, and the way uh, that that number comes out to 212 uh, decay weighted jobs. As you can see, it's a, it's a reasonable and intuitive number, falls in somewhere around you know, the, the 30 minutes or less, less threshold, but it reflects this fact that, that closer jobs are more valuable than further ones. We can look at the same map um, considering access to work by transit. So you see um, uh, much less uniform throughout the city. Uh, access to jobs by transit is high in the center of the city, again, where the jobs are. And that just sort of, sort of spreads out along transit lines throughout the city. We can look at that same location and see what their, job, their transit accessibility is. Um, within 15 minutes by transit, that person can only reach 250 jobs, so not many at all. Within 30 minutes though, they can reach 24,000. And that continues on the longer threshold you use. Uh, the access score that we would report is 18,000 jobs. And again, those are decay weighted jobs. Once we do something like look at transit accessibility, um, we can also overlay other layers of information. So in this case, we've overlaid um, where poverty is in the city. Um, and this would be this would let us scan for where there might be equity issues if we're concerned in in poor people's ability to get to jobs by transit. Um, this is what this helps us understand. Um, in this map, you can see the darkest areas that are almost a, a brownish color um, <clears throat> would be areas where there are folks in poverty um, that do have good transit service. Um, but on the edges, in the north and the south mostly, there are these areas that stand out in a brighter red. These would be places where there's poverty with poor transit access. When we have a measure like this, then we can do something like set policy goals. So we might say, um, it's important for the city to have some percent of households with a minimum level of accessibility. We wanna make sure that um, some percent of, of, of people living in poverty have, can, can reach at least some number of, of jobs by transit. Now, when we do that, we can actually evaluate some proposals. So we could take a look at a proposed transit improvement and say, does that actually help move things in the direction we want it to go? Does it improve access for the people that, we, that we're interested in improving access for? Uh, we could also take a look at our affordable housing and say, well, if we're building affordable housing, we want to make sure that it's being built in places that have good transit access. So this is really a way of tying together transportation, land use, um, and underlying um, policy goals. We can also track progress. So once we set a goal for ourselves, we can come back on a recurring basis every year or so and say, are we doing what we set out to do? Are we improving accessibility to jobs by transit for low-income people? You put it out in like a, a regular report um, <clears throat> or just use it internally, I guess. So I mentioned that you could evaluate a project. Um, this is an example of that. Uh, this shows a uh, bus line that was built um, in Madison a few years back. Um, and what the map is showing is how that bus line changed uh, access, access to work by transit for folks. Uh, so what the purple is showing is, is the difference between the before and after conditions. You can see that right around the end of that transit line, that bus line, uh, it had a pretty big impact on people. And we can actually go in again and see uh, someone living along that line, how, how their conditions changed. Within 15 minutes, the number of jobs they could reach by transit didn't increase a whole lot. Um, but within 30 minutes, the number of jobs they could reach increased from 1,400 to 8,800. Um, and you can go on down the list and see how many jobs they could reach within 45 minutes or an hour. Uh, the number we would typically report, our access score, is uh, an increase 
from 1,200 to 8,500. And that's just by um, multiplying the, the jobs um, by their decay function. You can also see though that the impacts are not limited to right along that line. There's actually a small effect throughout the city. And that's because you know there are some jobs along the transit line that people can now reach from anywhere in the city. Um, and also that transit line just generally improved the robustness of the transportation network. Uh, what we can do is take a look at throughout the entire county, we look at every household, every block, um, and say, what was the increase experienced by that person? Uh, and then we can multiply them all together and add them up. If we do that, we get a total impact of an increase in 1 million household jobs. Um, it's a big number, um, and it sort of ca captures the, the full effect, but it's kind of hard to interpret. Um, so we can also talk about that change in terms of the average impact to each household. So across all 200 households in the study area, um, the average increase was five jobs. So the average person throughout the entire city could reach five more jobs by transit because of this project. Um, if we'd had this tool when we were evaluating the project, you could have tested different transit alignments to see which one would have a greater impact. Um, or you could even compare the transit project to other types of projects, maybe a highway project or even uh, a bike connection across the highway there or something. C compare how the different projects perform, um, compare what they would cost, and see which one makes the most sense, depending on your policy goals. So that's all been using the access to jobs score, the non-work or the work access score. Um, we're going to take a look now at the non-work access score. And this is everything else. This is um, all the types of things that you'd reach that you need to get to on your day-to-day -day basis that aren't work. Um, and you can characterize, remember, this is um, scored from zero to 100. So that's what's being shown in this map. And you could consider um, access to, a, a, to bins of different destination types all, all mushed together. Um, or access to particular destinations. In this case, for this map here, um, we're using the, the waiting scheme shown here. So for a particular location, we go in and we say, uh, one of our destination types is restaurants, coffee shops, bars, et cetera. And we say, can that person reach eight of these things um, you know, using the decay function from that location? If they can reach all eight, they score 40 points out of 100. Uh, you go down the list, you can see there's grocery stores, and the target for grocery stores is two. So if someone can reach two grocery stores, uh, then they score 15 points out of the total 100. We do this for all the different de destination types and add them up, and they add up to 100%. That's how we get our, our score of 100. You can see from the map that the pattern is quite a bit different from access to jobs. Um, there is some concentration in the middle of the city where there's lots of stuff, but um, you also have good non-work accessibility on some of the outer areas where there are shopping centers, sometimes malls, sometimes um, town centers. So it is telling us something very different uh, about accessibility. Um, like I said, you could also just, um, instead of, so the table that I'm showing here is a bit arbitrary um, and you can use your own weighting scheme or scoring method. Um, you could also just look at a single destination type like groceries, your entire score could be based on groceries access if you're interested in something like food deserts. Um, and then that map would look quite a bit different. Like I mentioned, this scheme we're using here is a bit arbitrary, um, but we're working on developing a non-work non score in Virginia right now. Um, and that work is just wrapping up. So we'll have something that looks similar to this, um, but it's actually going to be based empirically on uh, what the existing conditions are um, in Virginia. Um, we're gonna vet it with um, some of the locals and other stakeholders. Um, and when we wrap that up very soon, um, that, that scoring approach will be made available and also the methods that we use to, to arrive at that. So you could use your non-work accessibility score in the same way that I showed before, where we could see how like a transit project improves access to non-work destinations. You could also do something like this, which is a land use project evaluation. Um, so in this case, the, the little black um, shape on the screen uh, is where there was a recent development in Madison. It was originally proposed to be a mixed use development. So it would have housing, but it would also have um, stores and restaurants and things. But at the time it was built, the economy was hurting um, and it ended up just being a residential development because they had to turn it around quick. Uh, you can see where that development is. It has pretty poor non-work accessibility, not easy to reach a lot of things from there. Um, partly because there's not a lot nearby, also because it's cut off from um, some larger roads and things. What we did was we went in and we said, if that had been built 
as a mixed use project as it was originally planned, how would that have changed non-work access in the area? So that's what's shown here. And you can see that um, building that as a mixed use development would have had a substantial impact. In this case, the project, right in the middle of the project, it would have added 20 or more points to its access score. Um, and then the surrounding areas would have also um, gained some benefit from that uh, because then they, they, they then have access to the, to the new types of destinations that that project provided. Um, so you could think of this as a tool for reviewing new developments. If um, your city was interested in setting um, accessibility goals, you could say that incoming developments had to meet some minimum threshold of accessibility or increase accessibility by a certain amount. Uh, and then they could do that either by making a project mixed use or by making sure that the project improved connections to some other nearby uses. <clears throat> One last application that I'm going to look at here, um, switching away from Madison, uh, is uh, a project that we've been doing in Sacramento, California uh, with um, our partner Transit Center. Um, and we've been looking specifically at connections to light rail transit in Sacramento. Um, so I'm just going to show that one specific application. We started off that study by actually um, scanning the entire um, region uh, and looking at accessibility near all of the light rail stations. Um, what's shown here is the station utility, and we calculated this just by looking at what was people's walking distance to the nearest transit station uh, using um, sugar calculations. So if someone could walk to the station within five minutes, um, that station had a very high utility to them. They were very likely to use it. Um, and then that utility dropped off the farther away, the, pe the longer people had to walk. That's what this is basically showing here. Uh, the important thing to notice is that at Swanston Station there, right in the middle, just to the east of that, um, it's a very pale color. It means there's no accessibility to the station um, from those, those neighborhoods just to the east. And the reason for that is that there's a freight line that runs right parallel to the station or to the to the line, um, and there's no way across it. So those folks are are essentially cut off; they cannot walk to the station directly. So we observed this just using accessibility measures. Um, it wasn't news to folks in the city. Uh, this is what the conditions are there. Um, you can see the station in blue, um, the fr the freight line running from the southwest to the northeast. And the city had already proposed a plan for improving connections to the station. Um, that would include some connections to the west, but also a pedestrian bridge right across that freight line connecting to the neighborhoods to the east. We also noticed that in addition to that freight line crossing, um, there's this uh, interchange underpass that uh, there's lots of jobs um, just to the south of that interchange. Um, so folks could, uh, in theory, walk from those jobs to the transit station, um, except that this is the conditions that we'd, they'd have to experience. So we can use accessibility measures to say what would happen if we um, improve those connections. We improve the connections to the station, we improve the experience for walking at that interchange um, and see how it, how it plays out uh, with the accessibility measures. So in this case, we're just looking at the pedestrian bridge, how it improves access to jobs by walking around the station. So you can see that it has a really large effect right nearby, people can reach um, upwards of 750 or 50, and 50 or more jobs um, by walking with that added bridge. Um, and the effect spreads out to the west quite a bit. Um, but we all, oh, and you can um, see the total effect um, within a three mile radius of that project. Um, the same way I described before, we multiply each household time the effect that they experience, you get half a million household jobs in total, or easier to understand on average within that three mile radius, um, people experience an increase uh, in access to, to nine jobs. Uh, that's by walking. Um, we treated that interchange, though, as though someone could not walk past it, as though the conditions were poor enough that it should not be considered uh, a, a pedestrian link. So you can see that the accessibility effects do not spread east of that interchange. We did another analysis where, uh, assuming that there was some improvements made that improved the walking conditions so that that was then an acceptable pedestrian link. And you can see the effect then, right? Spreads out much farther to the west and also to the east. Um, and within that three mile radius, the total impact is close to 3 million household jobs. And on average, within that three mile radius, people experience an increase in access to 47 jobs by walking. Now remember, we were looking at this because it was near a transit station. So that bridge connection also improved access to the transit station, thereby improved people's transit accessibility. We also looked at that. You can see the local effects again. 
very large local effects um, when you consider folks' transit accessibility. But there were jobs at that station, so people all throughout the region gained access to, to, to more jobs by transit through that project. Looking at the entire region, the entire study area, uh, the total impact is about 30 million household jobs, much larger number, but difficult to understand. So for the entire region, the average increase that people experience in that project is 50 jobs. They can reach 50 more jobs by transit um, on average throughout the entire region. So you can start to get a sense of how you could use these measures to compare projects, um, sort of quantify their impacts, um, weigh the pros and cons of different projects, have a conversation with stakeholders and other departments. So I mentioned these six applications and I've sort of walked through most of them with the examples um, shown. And uh, the one that I didn't really touch on is predicting outcomes. Uh, and this is sort of a new area of work for us. So when we look at accessibility, we can also um, not just look at individual modes, but compare the modes. So we can look at a particular location and say, we can see that auto accessibility is really high, transit accessibility is, is really low. Um, so we can actually uh, predict that most people are going to drive. Uh, and we can also similarly say that if transit accessibility improves so that it is better in relation to auto accessibility than it was before, that transit mode share is likely to go up. Um, and we've looked at this relationship a bit in Madison. Some partners of ours have looked at this in, in uh, Maryland and Virginia, and found that that relate that the ability to predict mode share with these measures is is actually uh, seems to be really good. Um, so not only can we talk about accessibility outcomes, but we can talk about what effect those things have on mode share. We can do things like estimate transit ridership, um, estimate travel demand and total vehicle miles traveled, um, and transportation costs too. So in theory, by you know, improving transit accessibility in relation to auto accessibility, you could lower people's household transportation costs. So this is a new realm that we're exploring, hoping to be working with a handful of states um, to really pin this stuff down uh, and put it into use. Unmuted. Scott, and we're going to turn things over to Matt Pettit now from City Labs. Yes, and while I'm uh, changing over, I just want to remind people that if you uh, have a question, we will be taking those at the end, but uh, feel free to go ahead and type in your question in the chat box and we will be able to take those questions at the end. So if you don't see the chat box, just click on the little orange arrow in the upper right of your screen and you should uh, the chat box should appear and then we can uh, take the questions at the end. So, Matt, uh, I think you're ready to go. Great. Muted. Hey, um, hello, everybody. My name is Matt Pettit. I'm a product manager um, here at City Labs, um, really focusing on our Sugar Access product. Perfect. Um, so, Sugar Access is an ArcGIS add on um, which measures multimodal accessibility. Um, so, when we talk about multimodal accessibility, um, it's everything that Chris described. Um, we're looking at all types of trips, walking, biking, public transport, and automobiles. Um, and the other big aspect of Sugar Access being an ArcGIS add-on is utilizing the ArcGIS platform. So, so much of what um, we do um, as planners and in the industry is measure what's going on today. What's our baseline accessibility? How many jobs can I reach today? But leveraging the tools within ArcGIS and the platform itself, we can really start to look at what if scenarios and start um, doing scenario planning to see what our future is gonna look like for accessibility. So when we drew up the Sugar Access product, we really wanted to focus in on having a very inclusive um, user base. So every planner at the local jurisdiction can use this tool to look at accessibility in their community. In order to do that, we, we have this concept of, you know, anyone should be able to ask a question about their community. So it may be, you know, I want to look at what's someone's access to jobs look like if they don't have a car and they have to commute to a service job which starts at um, 10 p.m. or midnight. So within the tool, within Sugar Access, I can actually, um, you know, it's as easy as selecting a destination, so jobs, um, choosing a time of day, which could be off peak or evening, and then choosing the mode of travel that we wanna look at. 
So just with that, um, we're able to run analysis and then get back some of the stuff that Chris was showing on what does my accessibility look like in this for this scenario. And then in the same light, we can start looking at other um, types of analyses. Um, this could be used for looking at uh, food deserts. So I could easily just say, hey, I want to look at access to grocery stores um, with walking and what does that look like for my community? So sugar access is really built um, for, it, for, it, for it to be used off the shelf. Um, and we really try to have everything right there ready for um, planners to use it. So let's go back to our, um, our friend who's trying to make a decision on how he's gonna make a trip, where he's gonna make a trip, um, and all of the aspects that are going into that. What we really wanna get into is, in terms of operationalizing this, we need to understand um, the data that we need, um, the information that we need to really better understand each one of these aspects. So I'm gonna go through each one of these and really talk about how we're making these a reality um, and creating this functionality within, the, within our tool. So the first one is, um, where do I need to travel? So we talked about um, both work and non-work destinations, because we really wanna capture um, someone's ability to make any trip that they may make, so any type of destination. So for the work destinations, um, right out of the box, we're using the loads data set, which is a publicly available um, nationwide data set that has employment information all the way down at the detailed um, census block level. What we've also come to realize is that um, both local jurisdictions, MPOs, um, state DOTs have so much valuable information in terms of um, what's going on today in terms of land use and employment and population. But what also is going on will happen um, maybe in 2030 and 2040 um, with their land use projections and economic projections. So what we do within Sugar Access is really keep an open platform so that users and planners um, can leverage their own data to do these types of analyses. In terms of the non-work trips, we utilize a data set called Points of Interest from here, which is a commercially available data set. Um, they are a navigation company and they update this data set um, quarterly. When we talk about points of interest and non-work destinations, we're talking about all the schools, restaurants, parks, hospitals, shops um, in your local area. So any type of non-work trip that you make is, can be captured within this database. And again, um, keeping with this theme of an open system, um, maybe a locality has information on um, job training centers um, throughout the region, and they want to ensure that they have ample accessibility to these job training centers. Um, that data can be put into Sugar Access um, in order to analyze that accessibility. The next question our friend asks when he travels is what modes are available? Um, so we're looking at auto, pedestrian, bike, transit. So what type of data can we use to help us analyze this? So for auto trips, we're also using the HERE data, um, the navigation company, to have an all streets roadway network. Um, and what's great about this roadway network, as Chris started alluding to, is that we're using actual speeds, actual travel times on these roadways throughout the day. So we understand how congestion may affect um, speed and someone's ability to travel. For pedestrian trips, um, what's, great, what's great about the All Streets Roadway Network is that it has every street. And not only does it have every street, but also has every bike trail, pedestrian trail in a region. So as you see on the picture on the right, this is depicting a all, the here All Streets Roadway Network. So we have a very detailed network. We have every street path that goes through this neighborhood so that it can capture every potential trip a pedestrian may make. For bike trips, it's a bit of a combination between both the auto information and the pedestrian information. So what we do is that we capture different roadway attributes and start building this concept of bike level of traffic stress, which may have, some of you may have heard um, and I will get into on my later slides. For transit, one of the biggest benefits of Sugar Access is that we build full multimodal transportation systems within GIS. 
So it's not good enough just to look at a transit system by itself and where, how far can I get to from one bus stop to the next bus stop, but we want to understand how I can get from my home to the bus stop by walking, take the bus stop somewhere to another stop, and then get to my final destination. So with what Chris's example of improving transit accessibility in Sacramento at the stop, that was an actual pedestrian project, but because we're using a full multimodal network, we're understanding how pedestrian projects can actually improve transit accessibility. So within our transit network, we're utilizing Google's GTFS schedules. So this is the exact schedule that, um, that the transit service is running locally. It has all stops, all the run times, and all the headways throughout the day. So we're capturing all of this in our multimodal network. So one of the big things um, is that we've alluded to a little bit is how accessibility is gonna change um, depending on the time that you're traveling. So, and we're especially, especially talking about transit and auto trips. So for transit, if I'm traveling the AM peak and I have to get to my job, maybe my, my transit frequency is 10 minutes and that's great. Um, and maybe the, also there's all, a lot of express bus service, which gets me downtown in half the time as the local service. But if I'm the same person and I have to get to a job in the evening where transit, the transit frequency is 60 minutes and there is no express bus service, then that's going to be a different story in how I travel. So all of these are being put into the functionality um, within Sugar Access. And the same for the auto trips and the roadway speeds, this changes drastically throughout the day. So whatever my congested speed is in the AM might not be the same case in the evening period. So when I do an analysis within Sugar Access, I can really see the change in accessibility and the effect that congestion has on my job accessibility. So on the left here, we're looking at job access during the AM peak using auto. And on the right, we have job access on the off-peak time using auto, and we can see how they drastically change because we're using real travel times throughout the day. The last question that we want to ask is, what's my travel experience? And this more applies to cyclists and pedestrians um, and the fact that they're they make travel choices based on the concept of level of traffic stress. So if I were to ask you as an audience right now, um, and you are, say that we're all bikers and we want to bike from destination A to destination B, would I rather bike on the road on the left or would I rather bike on the road on the right? And I'm sure everyone would say the road on the, the left, um, unless we're a bit crazy. But why is this? Is that we would rather bike on a neighborhood street than a state route arterial street. Um, we care about the speed limit and how fast the cars are going. We care about how many lanes there are on the traffic. If there's two lanes versus six lanes. And we also are looking at things such as the bike facilities and having um, you know good safety on those streets. So within, within Sugar access and utilizing that here, all street roadway network, we're able to capture a lot of these attributes of the roadway and start to understand and build a cyclist friendly um, network and understand how they connect to different destinations using this concept of level of traffic stress. So changing gears a bit um, back to some of the examples that Chris gave. Um, so if we remember his analysis of looking at stop access to transit stops in Sacramento, here we're going to look at a similar situation um, also in Sacramento. Um, so we have the transit stop here on the southeast side of this highway interchange. And on the northwest side of the highway change, we have a neighborhood. And as it is today, it takes about 25 minutes um, for those people in the neighborhood to walk to this transit stop. And for some people, 
a 25 minute trip to work, say, um, could be long enough as a trip as it is. So what we need to do is we need to potentially improve this accessibility to this transit stop. So we wanna ask ourselves, you know, what would the potential benefit be of adding this new pedestrian tunnel that could go under the on-ramp and connect um, this neighborhood better to the light rail stop. So utilizing the network um, editing capabilities within Sugar, we can actually add in this pedestrian path and see what would be if we added this path and improve the accessibility of the neighborhood. So now that we have a travel time from the neighborhood to the station of 10 minutes, we can start understanding what that benefit will be for not only access to the station, but access to jobs around the region. So we really wanna keep with this concept of analyzing scenarios and being able to understand the impact that our projects have on transportation. So going back to our friend for the last time, we need to leverage all this data to start understanding all these aspects. And if we do that, then we can start better predicting, as Chris alluded to, the decisions that people are gonna make if we change the transportation system and invest in transportation projects. And with that, I will turn it back to Robbie, um, who's gonna introduce um, some future work. Unmuted. Okay, thank you very much. And before we get into questions, I do want to just mention that we have, I guess, what we're calling part two of our um, of our accessibility uh, webinars, and that is that on April 18th, uh, you can see the times there. We're going to be having an example of real-world use of accessibility uh, in Virginia's Smart Scale program. Um, Smart Scale is a program at Virginia DOT that had uh, that rated every project that was submitted by local municipalities to the state DOT based on six criteria, and one of them was accessibility. And so um, we're going to hear how that work was done. And over the past couple of years, Virginia DOT, Renaissance Planning Group, City Labs, and SSTI have been working to improve the methods uh, and processes for measuring accessibility and scoring all these projects. So if you're interested in seeing how that was implemented, um, you can join us on April 18th, and the registration is on our website. So um, I'm going to just go down to the last slide, which will give you contact information for both Matt and for Chris, our two presenters today. And also, again, on our website, you can uh, sign up for that April 18th webinar if that's something you're interested in. So we're going to go ahead and go to questions here. Um, I'm just going to pull out the question box so that I can see it. And if you have questions that you haven't submitted yet, go ahead and type those into the uh, little chat box. Um, and you can access that by pulling out the orange button on the right upper right of your screen. So. Um, Let's see. Um, I'm just going to read. We have a lot of questions, so I'm going to just go ahead and see if I can read through a little bit. Um, how can scoring be used to show the impacts of accessibility on increasing transit frequency? Um, did we cover that, I think? Um, I think we've kind of covered that. Let me just double check. Mary, are the red ones the? OK. So does anybody want to say anything more about um, uh, showing the impacts of um, on accessibility of increasing transit frequency? Or do you think we've covered that? Matt could, but I would just say, yeah, so the, the, the travel times um, that are built in during each time period of the day um, account for how often uh, the, the uh, transit vehicle comes. So that would be built into the travel time calculations. Okay. 
Uh, how do you interpret the access score? Is it by time traveled? And I think we got that. Um, I think we just want to clarify that that's how um, that's how it's. Uh, oops, I'm sorry. It looks like just a moment. I have to uh, get Matt unmuted here. There we go. Okay, Matt, you're unmuted. If you wanted to jump in there. <laughs> um, yeah. Just, I guess, on the, the first question, um, so for improving frequencies, um, so there's a perceived wait time with different frequencies. So as you improve the frequency of the transit system within sugar, you'll actually see that net benefit of um, increase in accessibility because we're taking into account the potential wait time that people have at the stops. And so for the second question, um, in terms of interpreting the scores, the work score would be interpreted as the number of jobs that you can reach. And the non-work score would be interpreted as, if I score 100, then I can reach everything that's in that bin that I defined. OK. Um... I think someone wants you to go over uh, once more a little bit more about the decay function. Maybe you can just briefly explain that again uh, so that people understand sure. what that means. Sure. So we just looked at the distribution of people's travel times, so say for work, um, and we say uh, how many people travel five minutes out of everyone? What percent of people travel five minutes What percent or more? What percent travel 10 minutes or more? Um, and as you get up into the higher numbers, right? Let's say you get to 50 minutes and you find that um, uh, only 5% of people are willing to travel 50 minutes or more to work, right? Then that means that um, it shows an unwillingness to travel that far. And it shows that a job that far away is not particularly useful to people. So we would say that a job that, that's far, that is 50 minutes away would only count for 5% uh, of a job when we're adding up how many jobs can you reach. Okay. Um, so someone wanted to know, and this might come up a little bit in uh, the Virginia webinar and some of the work, uh, have you used uh, accessibility to compare projects across different modes? For example, compare a transit project to an auto roadway project? Yep, so you're right. That's exactly what the Virginia work um, will cover. Uh, in short, uh, what they did was every project that come in uh, that was put forth by the locals, um, no matter what mode, um, would be scored for accessibility impact in terms of uh, the first round was auto and transit accessibility. Uh, the third round also added pedestrian accessibility. And um, currently, um, what, what they do there is add up the total accessibility increase. So uh, an auto accessibility project might only increase, increase um, auto accessibility, um, but a, a pedestrian connection might improve walking and transit accessibility, um, and the scores are added up. And then they're um, scored on a bunch of different criteria also, and then divided by the cost. So you, in the end, what you get is what project has the greatest impact divided by its total cost. Um, and as I mentioned, we're actually um, looking into the idea of doing things differently, right? Not necessarily just adding up all the modal accessibilities, to get a total accessibility, but to actually look at the relative accessibility between different modes, which is something they're not currently doing in Virginia. Okay. Um, so we do have a question about, it says, uh, so much of our decision making is driven by financial considerations. Is it possible to describe accessibility in financial terms? Um, I think, well, part of the answer to that is what I just said, is that you can talk about the, you know, in terms of what, what gives you the greatest accessibility impact for the amount of money you're, you're, you're getting in. Um, so it's not necessarily translating accessibility into dollars. Um, but you can also, uh, once you get, like we said, once you get accessibility measures by different modes, you can sort of predict um, people's mode share, uh, what modes they'll choose, um, you can predict uh, VMT, how much people will have to travel by driving, um, and things like that. And then once you get at those kinds of numbers, you can turn accessibility into dollar values by seeing, you know, on average, 
um, how much money would a, a household save um, in theory by these accessibility increases and things like that. Okay. Um, it says that um, it appears you have data that is much more granular than is typical in travel demand models. How small are the zones that you're using and what are your data sources? I guess I can start. Yeah, I can start with that. Um, so as a as a default, we start with um, census block geographies, and part of the reason why we do that is to get into um, understanding how people travel in all modes and using traffic analysis zones, um, TAZs, which are generally around the same geographies as a census block group or census tract. Um, we don't really understand. Um, non-auto trips. So by using census blocks and smaller geographies, we can start understanding that information. Um, but again, um, Sugar Access is an open system in that, um, you know, if you wanted to do a local neighborhood analysis um, using parcels of two non-work trips, then you could do that analysis. Um, but for instance, for the Virginia project um, and them doing the analysis on a statewide level, um, they were using census block groups. So it's really up to the user, um, but it needs to be um, sensitive to the type of analysis that you're working on. Are you looking at auto trips? Are you working at um, pedestrian and bicyclist, um, cyclist trips? Um, and that will determine the, the data that you use, but everything is available um, for you to choose. Okay. Um, so someone asked about how you develop the decay curve for Madison, but I guess you could probably just answer that as far as can you develop or how do you develop a decay curve for a specific area? Sure. Um, so I think I, folks should understand the general concept um, that we just looked at the, the distribution of people's trips. Um, for Wisconsin, uh, the example I showed, we just used the National Household Travel Survey. Um, we've also used the uh, Census American Community Survey to look at people's travel um, to work, travel time distributions. Um, you could do pretty much any geography in the country using the National Household Travel Survey. Uh, the problem is when you start getting into trips by maybe by uh, walking and biking, uh, you need to have a large enough area that you're actually getting a sufficient number of those trips to understand the behavior. Um, if you have a travel survey, a local travel survey, that's maybe a little more robust, then you would probably want to use that instead. Okay. Um, so someone asked, how do you come up with the ranges for the non-work accessibility and work access? For example, you were able to say that a score of um, 87 to 100 scored high in terms of work access. Uh, is that just sort of a random assigning of what's high and what's low, breaking it out, or? Um, right, so I think that refers to just the, um, the, leg the scaling that we used on the maps that were shown there. Um, what we've done in Virginia, and I mentioned that we're trying to develop a, sort of a more empirical non-work score, um, what we did, the starting point, we, we, we looked at what were some of the, the highest possible scoring places in the state. Um, so these were places uh, near DC, uh, like Arlington and Alexandria. We saw um, what, kind of, what kind of targets could they hit? Um, what would be a realistic target for a very accessible place? Um, and that's what was our starting point for setting those targets. Um, and then everything um, scales down from there. So that would be the, the highest score and everything scales down to zero. Um, the next step is to, to then look at that and say, well, not everybody is going to score up in that uh, 90 to 100 range. Um, you might be a, uh, a small town, um, but uh, a considerably accessible place, um, but you'll still score uh, maybe something like a 60. Uh, we don't really know what that number would be, but maybe you know a, a, a mid-sized town um, with not much else around a 50 would be a really good accessible accessibility score for a place like that. We don't really have those answers yet, but that's the general idea. Okay. Uh, someone asked an interesting question. Are these tools applicable to rural areas? 
That is a good question. Um, so I was just kind of alluding to the fact that we've, we've kind of tried to figure out how to have these conversations um, about accessibility when it comes to different place types. So you might compare the big city to a, uh, a medium sized town. Um, and then there's also this question of rural places. Um, it's not really clear how it applies, but um, we're, we kind of think that maybe um, accessibility in rural places is, is not really the, the right measure to be using um, to understand how well the transportation system is serving people because uh, rural places are by inherently, by defi definition, sort of inaccessible. Um, so I guess it depends on, on particular policy goals, what you're trying to achieve um, with your transportation investments. And uh, that's really what it comes down to. Okay. And um, I, first of all, I'm going to acknowledge that we have far more questions than um, we're going to be able to get to. So I, I do want to emphasize that we have contact information for both of our presenters up on the screen. And um, also these slides will be available on our website so you can pick up that contact information if you have specific questions, because I know people have a lot of uh, very, very technical questions, and I know we won't be able to get to everything here. So I'm just going to kind of keep going through um, for at least a few more minutes. Um, and then I know people's time is, is precious, so at some point we'll have to cut it off. Um, so just to reiterate, uh, at one point Chris mentioned how far am I willing to travel. And as someone just pointed out, the question is really how long in time am I willing to travel? And I, I believe that that's what our scores are referring to generally is time and not distance for travel. So um, someone just also asked, and I think this was answered in the webinar, but maybe you can just uh, go over it one more time, what the data sources were for to create a comprehensive picture of non-work destinations. Sure, I can touch on that. So the non-work destinations were came from a data set, um, which is the points of interest um, data from here, which is a navigation company. So Within this data set, they have everything um, coded to the type of um, points of interest that it is. So is it a restaurant? Is it a school? Is it a library? Is it a park? Um, all of that is geocoded and built for the region that we're analyzing. So when Chris is running his non-work accessibility scores, it's querying this um, data set and understanding the access to these different types of destinations. Okay, so I've got a couple of technical questions here. The first of which is, how do you get all of the street um, roadway network? And um, maybe you can explain what's included if you're using Sugar. Sure thing. Um, so with Sugar, um, which, what's included in terms of the data are the things that we already talked about, the points of interest data from here, um, like a, a baseline um, census block, census block group layer with all the sociodemographic job information. Um, and then in terms of the roadway network, um, this also comes from here, navigation. So they have um, an all street roadway network with pedestrian paths, bike paths throughout a region. So the same, if anyone has a GPS in their car, this is the same type of um, roadway layer that we're using to do accessibility analysis. So it's extreme, extremely detailed, always up to date. It understands whether it's a pedestrian path that someone can walk on or a road that someone can drive on. The last piece of information is building a transit network. And that's when we use um, Google's GTFS schedules. So this is the same information that if someone um, goes to Google for transit directions, it's the same schedule that you're querying there that we're bringing into Sugar Access to bring a full complete um, picture of transit in a locality. I should add, and Matt can correct me if I'm wrong, that the Net, the road network also includes the actual travel speeds um, on every link um, throughout the time of day, and that's coming from, from actual vehicle probes. 
correct. Okay. And um, someone had a question about the empirical basis for the calculation of bicycle stress, the bicycle level of stress. I mean, sure. No, yeah, I can, I can go into that. Um, it's something that we've just started um, developing and working on. Um, we put together a, um, a first um, test case in our Virginia project. Um, but essentially, it's based on the same concepts that um, Manetta has put, put out for their um, bike level of traffic stress, taking into account um, the number of lanes, um, you know, the bike facility information if you have it, um, the speed of the roadway. So all those things are taken into consideration um, when we're talking about um, biking and bike level of stress. And for those who might want to look that up, um, you can Google Peter Firth, F-U-R-T-H, at Mineta Traffic Institute, and you'll find the, um, the methodology. Um, so we do have some technical questions here. Um, let's see. Is the loads data available on the website? Is it a point layer? Oh, on which website, I guess? I don't know if th that, that no, makes sense. Loads, I don't have that on the top of my head. If you have loads it. is tied to not to points, but to um, census geographies. Um, and that is publicly available data, although I'm not sure what um, geography it's provided. Okay. It's, pro it's provided at the census block um, level, but I can't remember the website off the top of my head. Okay. And try, if, if you're looking for that, try um, loads, L-O-D-E-S, and also L-E-H-D is the data set. Okay, great. And uh, someone asked, I'm curious about the relationship between street and streetlytics and sugar access. Do they use the same underlying data and how are they different? Sure. Um, so streetlytics is um, City Lab's traffic transportation analytics tool. Um, and that uses a lot of, of different data sets. It uses here data, for instance, and that vehicle probe data to have the actual vehicle speeds. Um, so in terms of that, that's really the only relationship at this point. But we're, we're developing and constantly working on bringing things in, such as um, information at um, traffic volume. So within Streetlytics, we have traffic volumes at different times of the day throughout the entire US. So with that information, we want to keep building on our, street, our um, sugar access capabilities so that when we do things like bike level of traffic stress, that we're actually understanding the volumes and how the volumes are different in terms of traffic um, for bikers. Okay. The big conceptual difference, I think, is to think about accessibility as a measure of um, where could I get to? Where could someone get to? Um, and something like streetlytics and other sort of probe data and things like that as answering the question of what are people doing? Where are people and where are they going? How are they acting? Yeah. And it, it creates, um, it comes up with something that we'll probably start getting into and start looking at, um, and that's utilizing um, cell phone traces and GPS information to start understanding, yet yeah, where people actually go. And that's what's being put into Streetlytics. So it's, you know, you could put it out there as a validation of an accessibility model to understand not only just for with accessibility of where can I get to, but double checking that and validating that with GPS cell phone trace data to understand, okay, well, this is where people actually go. So we start to get better information on a local level as we, um, as we um, work on this type of analysis. Okay. And I'm gonna make this the uh, last question here. Um, thank you very much to both Chris and uh, Matt for all the information. And again, you can contact them for further questions. But uh, here's a question that I'm sure a lot of people want to know. And the answer may be, it depends. But the question is, what is the cost associated with the sugar application? Sure. Um, so the cost of sugar access really um, differs on a um, region by region basis. Um, you know, depending on the population of the area, the number of seats um, that a user has. Um, so that's something we can 
um, answer offline if someone has a specific question about implementing sugar um, for their local area. We work with MPOs, we work with cities. Um, we're working with the entire um, state of Virginia on a enterprise license for them, anyone within, um, so anyone within a government organization within Virginia has access to sugar access. Um, so we definitely, we work on different um, implementation levels, so it definitely depends. So please um, send questions if you have um, specifics on on that. Okay. Well, I want to remind people that we do have another webinar coming up in April um, that is going to talk about Virginia. We did have some questions specifically about Virginia, and I'll bet you those will be answered in our April webinar. Um, also, we do have a newsletter that comes out approximately every two weeks, and you can follow us on Twitter, and we've got lots of good resources on our website. Um, and the webinar will be up there tomorrow along with the slides. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Thanks very much to uh, Matt and Chris.